Jeez. What's up? Good day. That's for a midget. That's Keith. That's Keith Bricken size right there. What that was. All right. Everybody having a good week? All right, good deal. What's up, Brendan? You have a good week? Good, good. I'm glad you did. What about it, girls? Y'all good too? Good. Y'all going to wake up a little bit in here. It's good to see you tonight. I'm glad that you're here. Um, how many of you all have enjoyed the past couple of weeks with, with Donnie? It's been good. Amen. 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 Well, we're privileged to, to have Donnie here, and he shared his testimony. How many of you were here last week? Okay. All right. All right. Well, tonight is going to be the, the ending segment and the follow-up of everything. Every, if you notice how we try to do things at real life, and it's not always like this, but we always try to build off on one, one thing after another. We always try to, to make everything um, end up following what we just did, and that way we can apply it more to our lives, and hopefully it'll give you a little bit better understanding of, of what's going on, because I would, I would bet uh, that most of us in this room tonight have questions still going on. Now, I want to ask you this. How many of you all remember what this cross looked like last week? You remember what it looked like? It was white, it was white wasn't it? It was white. It was covered with paper, covered with sin. How many of you all, and I want you to be honest with me, a lot of hand raising right now, but how many of you all nailed something to the cross last week? You laid it down. Now, I want you to keep your hands up just for a second. You're saying you nailed something on the cross. Now, keep your hand up if you truly laid it down. But if you didn't, and if you struggled with it again, I want you to, to bring your hand down. So everybody's got your hands up. You say that you laid it down last week and you haven't struggled with it again, right? Okay. All right. Well, this is what the cross looked like last week. Okay. It was covered with, with all sorts of, of sin and paper. And, and you guys had the opportunity to write down what it was in your life that you were struggling with, whether it be pornography, suicidal thoughts, drug addiction, uh, lust, lying, maybe you're angry at your parents or at yourself, depressed, whatever, and you had a chance to write it down, and you nailed it to the cross, and you got rid of it, okay? And so that's what it was this week. And what I want you to do right now is I want you to close your eyes, nobody looking around, nobody making a racket, nobody being stupid or anything like that, just close your eyes, and I want you to think about what it was that you wrote on that piece of paper and nailed to the cross last week. Nobody looking around. Nobody doing anything. Just think about that piece of paper and what you wrote on it, okay? Now, as soon as you picture that sin that you wrote on that piece of paper, as soon as you get it figured out and realize what you nailed to the cross, then you can open your eyes and look at the cross now because it's gone. That sin that you put on this cross that you nailed on there, it's gone. Look, no more nails. You know why? Because when you put those nails and that paper in there, you nailed it on there and you said, I'm done. You put something through that sin that held it on that cross so it would be no more in your life. And God said, you know what? I don't want to hold on to that sin. I'm not holding on to it for you and I'm not holding on to it for me. So I'm going to get rid of it. So this cross is smooth tonight. Because each and every one of you all's sins are forgiven and gone. And I don't know if you all realize how powerful that is. But for the ones of you who all made a decision last week to follow Jesus for the first time, there were five or six of you. For the ones of you all who did that, do you realize that you nailed it down and you're no longer the same? You see, we see, uh, you all have seen crucifixes, right? You know what I'm talking about? You see it in a lot of Catholic backgrounds, and I'm not knocking on them, I'm just I'm making reference to them. Catholics use the crucifix. You know what I'm talking about? It's a cross, still got Jesus hanging on it. Why isn't Jesus hanging on our cross? Because he's off. He ain't on the old cross anymore. He's not in the grave anymore because, see, he arose. You know, he's, he's risen from the grave. And Hannah, here's what's so cool. Here's what I find so neat about Jesus Christ. Let me teach you for a second. Everybody look at me. Anybody could have died. We could have crucified Donnie for our sins. Donnie, we could have poured out your blood upon our sins and, and never been forgiven. But the fact is, if we would have put Donnie up here and put him in a grave, 
Donnie would still be sitting in the grave. But because we killed Jesus, the Son of God, he got back up on the third day. He actually arose out of the tomb. They actually saw him with scars on his wrist and on his, on his feet from where they nailed him to the cross. They actually saw him because he got off of that cross. He's gone. He's, he now sits at the right hand side of the throne in heaven with, with God. And so I want you to think about that. Jesus is no longer on the cross. And I want you to think about this. Your sins are no longer on this cross. Say, my sins. Say it louder. Say, my sins are not on the cross. They've been forgiven. And if you live your life like that and realize that no longer, JT, does God hold on to that stuff and does Jesus hang on to that stuff. Because, see, how many of you all in here have ever been done wrong by somebody? Anybody in here ever been done something wrong to you? The guy's like, man, something, all you girls, y'all like, oh, yeah, girl. Somebody all the time doing something to me. You know what I'm saying? And so we got our hands up. But here's the deal. All of us in here have had something done wrong to us. We've been done wrong by somebody. But the, the problem is, is we say we forgive them, but how many of you will remember that? You remember what somebody did? Y'all lying like a dog. I know you remember. I remember stuff. People call me stuff when I was in seventh grade. Aaron, I'm still holding on to it today. Man, I used to have a bowl haircut. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I was, I mean, I looked good. Had a little comb over. I was in seventh grade walking down the hallway. I had my glasses and my comb over and my books in my hand. I was like, what's up, girl? And she's like, girl, don't talk to me. You know what you're talking about? So anyway, but I thought I was some cool stuff, and people would say hateful things just like they do to you all, or just like they come after you, just like your family attacks you, because some of you in here have been told by your parents, and you've been told by your peers, and your teachers, and your friends, so-called friends, that you'll never amount to anything, and that you're no good, and that you, why are you even alive? You were a mistake, but that's not the truth, because God has a purpose for you. And see, here's the thing. We remember this stuff. Johnny, we can't forget it. We remember how things happened a long time ago. But Jesus tells us in his word that when he forgives us, he throws our sins as far as where? Now, why wouldn't he go to the north as to the south? Hey, Jay? Because what? It's going to meet. You know, I can only go north so far on this globe, and eventually I'm going to have to go where? And I can only go south so long, but eventually, Zach, I'm going to have to go. But if I go east, I'm always going to go east. And if I go west, I'm always going to go west. And the thing is, is that Jesus said, when I forgive you of your sin, when you call on my name, Tony, and you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, forgive me of what I've done wrong against others and against you, when you forgive me of that, I want you to think about what he does. He grabs it, and he just throws it. And it's gone. He doesn't even think of it anymore. Sheridan, he don't, it doesn't even cross his mind that it, it happened. He, he doesn't hold on to the past like we do. He says it's gone, and it's gone forever. Now, the Bible tells us in many different places. In fact, one of the best books to read in the Bible when it comes to um, sin and the repentance of sin and the forgiveness of God and things like that is Paul's, uh, church, or Paul's letter uh, in Romans. And if you'll read Romans, all throughout Romans, it actually talks about uh, the forgiveness of sins and God's grace and things like that. And one of the, uh, some of the scripture that I sought out today and I looked at and it came to mind is that uh, one is from Romans 6, verse 18, and it says this. You don't have to look this up, you can if you want to. It's Romans 6, 18, and it says, You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Now, about two months ago, I preached a series of sermons, and we talked about how we are slaves to what? We are slaves to, to what? To sin. We are slaves to sin. But the thing is, the Bible tells us that, Donnie Wayne, we can only serve sin for so long, but eventually we've got to give up. And when we quit serving sin, and we quit being a slave to sin, then we have to become a slave to righteousness. And you see, guys, here's the problem. Some of you all in here, you say that you're not a slave to anybody, but you are. You're a slave to yourself, in your own thoughts, in your own worries. You're a slave to your parents, in your school, in your sports. Some of you are a slave to church. Some of you are a slave to each other. 
Some of you are a slave to Satan. But a lot of us in here have been slaves to sin. But it tells us that once we've laid our sin down, once we've nailed it to the cross, we've asked for forgiveness of our sin, and we've been saved. Johnny says that we are no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. And so last week, if you laid your sin down, and you truly laid it down, I'm not talking about come up here and nailed it to the cross and said, well, I laid it down. I'm talking in your heart, searched it out, said, Jesus, I am so tired of packing this around. Maddie, I'm so tired of having this stuff on my back. And I just want to lay it down. If you said that and you meant that, then it's gone. And you don't have to worry about it anymore. You're not a slave to it any longer. Now you can serve righteousness, which is God. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That verse looked familiar, mission team members? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because you see, guys, here's the deal. All of us in this room, whether you want to admit it or not, we're a mess. And some of you in here, you act like everything's okay. But you're actually pretty easy to read. Because unfortunately, there's some of you in here that are still right now dealing with thoughts of suicide, struggling with drug abuse, struggling with alcoholism, you're wanting to fit in, you've got a smoking problem, you've been hurt by somebody, now you're tore up, you're mad at the church, you're mad at me, and you're mad at everybody around you. And the thing is, is you won't let go of it. But God says, that's okay. That's okay. I came to die for you right where you are. You don't have to do anything special. Donnie, we wouldn't have had to have even nailed these sins to the cross, and he just still died for us. He still loved us that much. Romans 6, 2 says, We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Now, here's the question, guys. How many people in this room right now can raise your hand and you can say that, Brother Daniel, if I was to die right now, I know without a shadow of a doubt that I would go to heaven. I'm a Christian. You can raise your hand and say that you know without a shadow of a doubt. Don't second guess. Don't raise your hand because your neighbor raised your hand. But you know that you know that you know that you're going to go to heaven. Okay, check this out. I want everybody that just raised your hand to look at me. I'm going to ask you a question. If that is the case, why do you still live in sin? But do, Zach, do we use that? Zach says we're not perfect. Do we use this as an excuse? But why do we? Because we're human. But what should we strive for? For what? Righteousness? To be Christ-like? You see, because here's the deal. Most of you have heard me teach on this before. So many people say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. But Christian means Christ-like. So how many people in here, you say that you're a Christian, but your life doesn't reflect it? Nobody wants to raise your hand on that one. Because that's embarrassing, right? But the problem is, is that some of you did lay it down and it's gone. Some are still holding on. I'm going to tell you tonight a story that's in the Bible about people that are in a similar situation to us. And I want you to pay attention because I'm going to name off three or four different kind of people that we are like in this, in this story, okay? In John chapter 6. This is John chapter 6, and I'm going to skip around. I'm going to be all over this whole story. I'm just going to read parts of it. Now, first off, is I'm going to tell you about the person who travels after Jesus. You follow after Jesus. Now, I would bet to say, if I was a betting man, that most of you all in here tonight probably came, hopefully, to hear and to learn a little bit more about Jesus, right? Now, some of you probably came for some food. Some of you came for some basketball. Some came for a girl or a guy. Some came for some unknown reason. But most of you probably and hopefully came to hear a little bit about Jesus. So check this out. We are travelers after Jesus. In John chapter 6, starting in verse 1, it said, Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Now I want you to be honest with me. How many of you all have seen stuff happen at church? Maybe it's a healing or maybe somebody getting saved. And you think, man, that's cool. I want to see that. Anybody ever been there? 
Like, I don't know about you guys, but if I see something happen, like, I don't want to go to a dead church. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I don't want to walk up in a place where nothing's happening. They haven't seen a soul say. They don't believe in healing. I don't want to be around people like that because if they don't believe, I don't need to be up in that. I want to go somewhere where it believes it and they teach, they teach it and they're a part of it. And so how many of you all have seen somebody saved, maybe one of your friends, seen somebody healed and you've seen it, and so you say, man, I want to see some more. I'm going to go check it out. Anybody ever been like that? That's exactly what was going on. You see, Jesus had been healing people. He'd been healing the lame, healing the sick. He'd been speaking, and people were like, wow, this is Jesus, and he claims to be a prophet and the Son of God. And people are tripping out, man. They're following him and, and checking him out and going everywhere he goes. They're, they're chasing after him. Now, all of us in this room, for some reason, tonight are here. But how many of you all came here tonight because you're chasing after Jesus? How many of you came tonight because you want to know more about Jesus and more about his love and more about his mercy and more about his grace? You see, that's the thing, okay? You can put your hands down. You're chasing after Jesus. So you're the first kind. Now, I'm going to skip on through the story, and I'm going to go down to verse 24. And it says, once the crowd, everybody say, once the crowd. Once the crowd, once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boat, and they went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. Everybody say, I'm searching for Jesus. I'm searching for Jesus. Are you? Girls, I can't hear y'all. Y'all awake over here? What was it? Oh, well, who was searching for Jesus, all right. So they said, you're searching for Jesus. Now, what happened is this crowd was following him. Now, I want you to check this out. I want you to think about in this room right now, if Jesus Christ was in here tonight, right here, up here with me, and he was to leave this room, how many, and I want you to be honest with me, don't just raise your hand or raise your hand, how many of you all, if Jesus was to walk back here, how many of you all would follow him, just see where he went? I know I would. I'd be like, yo, dude, what's up? <laughs> Jesus, hang on, dog, you know? I want to catch up with him. I'm like, man, hang on. What's up? And so the crowd's doing the same thing. They were, they were out wandering and traveling with him, and then they went searching for him, and they couldn't find him. They couldn't find him. And so here's what they did. In verse 25, it says, When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, check this out, this is what Jesus said. I didn't say this, nobody else said this. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, said this. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, mm, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spools, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. It says some of you all are searching for food that spoils. And the only reason, Spencer, that you're following Jesus is because you get your little fix. You know the main reason people come to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday? Can I be honest with you? Can I be honest with you? It's not because they truly have a desire to seek out the face of God. It's because they feel guilty about what they've done that week and they want to go pray about it in the altar and then go right back out and do the same thing all over again and then seek the face of God in the altar. I see it all the time. I see it every Wednesday. I see it every Sunday. Well, Pastor, I just can't get this stuff figured out in my life. And I'm like, have you laid it down? Yeah. Then why do you keep picking it back up? You see, the thing is, is we're just like these people. We say we're searching for Jesus. We say we're traveling after him, but God is telling us right now, and I want this to apply to you all in here. Let me put it like this. Let me put it as simple as I can. He says, how many of you all, this is what he says, how many of you all are searching for me for the feel I give you instead of what I can do for you instead of the real Jesus that I am? And so pretty much it comes down to this. How many of you all are here for some other reason? Or how many of you all are here for him? And I want you to think about that and continue to let that just build in your spirit and examine your hearts just for a few more minutes. In verse 30, I'm going to tra travel down. It says, what sign then will you give that we may see? And this is what the people are asking him. What sign will you give so that we could see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. 
He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Talking about Moses. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. See, now there's a third kind of person. What are the people in here tonight who you see miracles, but yet you still don't believe? I wonder how many people, I want you to think about this. I preached a revival Saturday night at a New Beginnings Community Church in Springfield. And God blessed it, man. We had uh, seven salvations that night, and the Lord moved, and the Spirit fell, and it was a good night. So I want you to check this out. I want everybody in here, just real quick, I want to show you something. I want to ask you something. Close your eyes, just real quick. Once again, just close your eyes. Nobody looking around, nobody acting stupid and foolish, all right? Check this out. Close your eyes, and I want you to think just for a second, what if right now the rapture was to occur? Because on a Sunday morning, about a year, maybe a year and a half ago, sitting about where Sarah Gilpin is sitting over here right now, I was worshiping the Lord, and all of a sudden the Spirit of God fell on me, and God said, Daniel, if I was to lift this roof off right now and come back in the rapture, how many people would still be left sitting in this church? And I thought, man, we're at, we're at church on Sunday morning. What do you mean, God? I mean, there'd probably be, I don't know, what, 10, 15 left? And I opened my eyes. And Donnie, what I saw was unbearable because I didn't see 10 or 15 people still left. I saw hundreds, hundreds of people left. Now you can open your eye and I want you to look at me. And here's why I think I saw what I saw. It's because so many people have seen signs and miracles. They've seen healing. They've seen people get saved. They've seen people's lives be changed. They've seen all this stuff that has supposedly made a difference and made them desire more God. But they never truly believed it. They never truly grasped hold of what it was that God wanted them to receive. And so they just kept coming to church. How many of you all have heard the song, is it Matt Redman that sings Going Through the Motions? You all know that song? I think Haywood actually preached a sermon on it one Sunday. It was a good sermon. That's a, that's a great, great way to go with it, Coach. Going through the motions because so many people do go through the motions. Do you? Do you, young lady? Do you, young man, are you saying that Jesus Christ is the king of your heart, but yet truly there's been no change in your life whatsoever? Do you still talk the way you used to talk? Do you still hang out with the people you used to hang out with? Do you still drink what you used to drink? Because here's the deal. The Bible clearly tells us that Jesus is not going to hang around sin. He's not going to do it. And so the way I see it is this. If you say Jesus is in your heart, but you go out and live like a heathen, Jesus is not in your heart. He's not there. Now, for the ones of you all who laid this stuff down last week, it's gone. 2 Corinthians 5.17, one of my favorite verses, and you guys hear me say it all the time. What is it? All the old has, what? Gone, and the new has come. So, if you laid it down, then it's gone. Don't worry about it anymore because new has come. But here's the deal. So many people have not laid it down and left it. But can I tell you something? Last week, when you all laid it down and when these tears were shed, I mean, this, this board up here, this wood up here is starting to buckle because of the weeping that took place around it. And when you laid that sin down and you said, I'm done, Worrying about stress. I'm done worrying about suicide. I'm done worrying about drugs. I'm done worrying about pornography. I'm done worrying about stress. I'm done worrying about depression. I'm tired of crying myself to sleep. I'm tired of mom and daddy not approving of this. I'm tired of being hurt by the world. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of that. And I'm sick of this and sick of that. When you said that, when you meant it, and when you cried out to God, the Bible says clearly that God will hear your prayers and he will answer your prayers. And so I've come to tell you tonight that we we may be like some of those people. We may be traveling. We may be searching. And we may not believe. But can I tell you tonight that if you will offer it up to God, it's not up for discussion. It's taken care of. Whether I agree with it, whether you agree with it, it's done. So here's the, th here's the last thing. Here's what i got to tell you with this. There was the people who traveled after Jesus. Some of you are coming just to come. Some of you are here just to be here. I don't know why, whether it's because you want to seek out something, whether it's you like the preaching, 
or whether it's you like the singing, whether it's you like your basketball, the food, or whatever. Some of you are here for some unknown reason, but God has you here for a purpose, okay? Now, some of you here are searching for Jesus, and you're looking for him, yet you will not believe in him, and you will not trust him, even though he's made himself very evident to you. I talked to... Uh, a couple weeks ago on a Sunday night, I talked last week briefly, and I talked this past Saturday night because this is what God has really been showing me, is how much the hand of God is over our lives. The hand of God is so over your life right here that if he was to remove it, the breath in your body would be removed and you would die. So right now, the hand of God is over your life and allowing you an opportunity to be here for some reason. What is that reason? You see, if you were here last week, God didn't have to allow that to happen. Donnie told you that wasn't even supposed to be preached until this week. But God moved it up a week. Now, what did he do it for? Who in here needed that to get rid of it? Okay. That's his fruit and he used it. Somebody here that could have heard it last week that may not have been here this week. Now, I want you to think about that. If that's the way God works, do you all believe that's the way God works? Because, you see, I don't believe in coincidence. You know what I'm talking about? Like, love at first sight kind of goofy stuff. I don't believe in that stuff. I don't believe in that, okay? Here's what I believe in. God's divine purpose in my life at a certain reason, or for a certain reason at a certain time. You know what I'm talking about? Like, God will put somebody, for instance, today... I had to make a phone call, okay? I made a phone call about a situation that I was dealing with here in the ministry. And so I make this phone call, and I'm telling them about what's going on. And it was so cool, Donnie. I, I, I brought the situation up, and the woman goes, I know exactly what you're talking about. I know. And I go, do you? She goes, yeah, you're from Elkhorn Baptist Church, aren't you? And I said, yes, ma'am. Man, I tell you what, y'all got a killer program going on out there. You're busting out the seams, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. So then this evening, Brian comes up, and Brian goes, I was talking to this woman, and all of a sudden, he gets to telling me about how somebody uh, talks to him, and they say, man, I know all about what's going on there at Elkhorn Baptist Church. Just another thing of encouragement. I didn't have to run into him, didn't have to talk to him. It just happened. Man, that's how God works. And see, if God works that way then, why wouldn't he work this way now that you are here, and you were there, and he has a purpose for you? You see, the thing is, guys, is we're, we're, we're traveling, we're searching, and, and we're still not believing. But here's what God tells us we got to do, okay? Some of you got it right last week. I'm going to say it again, and we're going we're gonna to close out. Check this out. It says, then Jesus declared, this is verse 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread, say bread, bread. of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and I, and I, I'm sorry, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All whom the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up in the last day. Can I tell you something? We please ourselves. We will travel after what we want to travel. We will drive more miles for a daggone baseball game than we will to come to church on Sunday morning. We will stay up all night on Saturday night and hang out with whoever we want to and then come into church on Sunday morning dragging, looking like our dog got run over and, and we're mad at the world. You know what I'm saying? And we have all these excuses I, I, about why we can't serve God and why we can't do this and why we can't move forward. But when it comes down to it, God says, I've got such a purpose for you and I have showed you time and time and time and time again that, that I am so real, but yet you still don't believe. So I'm coming to tell you tonight that what you did last Wednesday night when you nailed those sins to this cross is done and it's taken care of and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Now, most of you all that raised your hands that said you nailed something to this cross, you told me that you were being honest in the house of God 
And God knows you wouldn't lie to a preacher in the house of God, now would you? Uh Uh-huh. And you told me that when you laid it down, that you didn't pick it up again this week. Is that true? How many of you laid it down? And you're telling me you didn't pick it back up. You see, because when you do that, Johnny, that's when he throws it as far as the east is from the west. That's when it's completely ridden of, Jenna. It's gone, not even thought about. Man, if the love of God is so much, did you know that the Bible tells us, Lenore, that God knows every hair on your head? Now, how many hairs you got on your head? How many hairs I got on my head? Start counting. Honey, you ain't going to be able to count the hairs on my head. And here's the deal. God says he loves us so much. Check this out. Amy, he knows the amount of hairs on our head. Now, how many of y'all, and, and I know some of you come from some messed up situations, okay? But how many of you all know that your mama loves you? Your daddy loves you? Grandma, somebody loves you, okay? And if you don't think anybody loves you, can I tell you something tonight? I love you. This church loves you. More importantly, Jesus loves you, okay? But check this out. Here's the deal. They love you. I love you. But I don't know how many hairs you got on your head. And I ain't about to take the time to count. Okay? But here's the deal. God says he loves us so much that he knows the hairs on our heads. Shannon, he says that he knows the thoughts before they even enter our mind and the words before they even exit our mouth. He says, uh, we're told in Psalms that that he's what gets us up in the morning and lays us down at night as Billy Ray likes to pray. It's true. the, The word says that. And so if that's the truth, and that's how much God loves us, why do you think that he wouldn't love you enough to forgive you of your sins? You are forgiven. And the Bible says that if you have been set free, you are free indeed. You are free indeed. You no longer have to hold on to it anymore. He gave his son for us. That's how much he loved us. That's a love, an agape love. How many of you all would be willing to lay down your life for someone else? You would give your, how many of, okay, let me ask you this. How many of you all would die for me right now? You'd take a bullet for me. Because there's a guy standing at those doors right there, and he's wanting to kill me, and I need somebody to go out there and do it for me. You're going to die for me? Yeah, a few hands went down. (laughs) All right. Well, check this out. How many of you all would die for your mom? Your dad, your best friend, all right? Close your eyes for a second, again. And the reason I have you close your eyes is I just want you to think about how powerful this is. What if I told you that I have a man back here in this room, and he's raped six young girls. He molested them. He's murdered five or six different people. He's robbed a couple of places. And he's guilty of all sorts of crimes. If I told you that, how many people now would die for that man? You would die for that man. Put your hands down, and I want everybody to think about this. Continue to keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed. And just let that.